chapter 8. You think you know a guy. Shafts of light broke through the hard tempered house. As they did, the early morning sounds of Ponyville began to sound out over the foot of the path. Cupcake's father was the first to awake, as he always had been. Even the challenge presented by the presence of his grandchildren in the house had not wrestled caught many of these small morning hours from him. Light was becoming more evident every morning. As he breathed the morning invoked, he stood in that light and took it as a promise that Celestia was racing the sun earlier each day, that spring was indeed coming. As he put the kettle on, the light cascaded in through the skylight that he had built all those decades ago. He gave a small curse as he saw a few drops of water hanging at the space where the brass met the ceiling. He had to reseal it this year. That, however, was a summer job. As he waited for the water to boil, he stared out across his wide lawn to the road below. It was for the better that winter was ending soon, that he and his family would soon once more do their part in the annual winter wrap-up. How nice it be to have children helping out this year. Though the circumstances of his eldest daughter's return were unhappy, he would have been a liar if he said that he did not like having his grandchildren with him. Cupcake's father ran his hoe through his mane and gave a long sigh. As a few gray hairs came loose, he batted them through the air. Soon the oil. As he grabbed the mugs out of the finally appropriate Canterbury, he made her a tea first, and then his own, as he always had. Cupcake's father's ear felt his ears perk up. There was movement overhead, and with a gruff laugh, the old stallion knew that his grandson and granddaughters were now rising. He wondered how long it would be before they, too, are the importance of sleeping in on Saturdays. His name came echoing to him, and within seconds he was heading back up the stairs. He turned and looked first towards the rooms beyond the sounds of the hosts of his grandchildren, echoed around in their bedrooms, the sounds of small games rising into the air. His name came to him again, this time on the opposite end of the hallway. There, a dear face met his, and he went up to her quietly. You all right? He asked as he placed her off her husband his, lingering into him. You want to head back to bed, or do you want to come downstairs at all? I got your tea on. Oh, she answered in a thin voice, walking out of the bathroom with weak steps. I think I'm all right to go downstairs today. I think I'll be better today than yesterday. Yesterday had been horrible. Do you want to try her? Can you walk? He says he brushed back some of her mane as it felt across her face. You want me to carry you down? I should not have to carry me down on these stairs, she sculpted in a light tone. Oh, the fear that went through me the first time he did. You know I never drop you. He spoke in a tone that almost seemed hurt. You know that? I know. She stands here rubbing her cheek tender tender tenderly. I know. With that, he led her down the stairs and placed her in the big soft chair before the fireplace. Seeing her safe... He went to retrieve her wheelchair from the upstairs room. He used to live to retrieve it. It was another addition to his house that he built himself. He relied on his own prowess to construct. As he returned, he suddenly felt himself assaulted, and he looked down to see the smiley faces of foals wrapped around three of his legs. Bwah! He sounded out as he pretended to be a behemoth of old, stopping the hallway as they clung to him, giggling as they went. His powerful legs lifted him. He only sussing as he passed the room where their mother still slept. Upon reaching the top of the stairs, he saw another familiar figure appear before him. As his family began to come awake, he smiled at another inhabitant of his home they had made, of this house he had built. Room for more and more? He spoke, offering Cupcake his last free hoof. Oh, Daddy! She says he placed a morning kiss on him. With that, she leaned down to speak with her nieces and nephew as he left his legs to give her a morning hug. This is uh, hurting me. Too cute. Why don't you grab up some toys to sit and play with them in front of the fireplace? I said Grandma would love to play with you. She asked as she looked to them. With small giggles, the Colton fillies ran down the hallway. Before long, they gathered up some of their things and were coming down the stairs. Their grandmother greened them as they appeared. Cupcake's father rode the lift down with the wheelchair. He was not as young as he had been. A truth he appreciated being here as much as he had been happy. It gave her back some movement. 
He strode to the kitchen with the thought of beginning to make some breakfast for his family. But, to his happiness, he saw his youngest daughter had already begun. As Cupcake went to work, he marveled at how much better she had become at baking over the last few months. He wondered where that Patrice flowed. Her new town, perhaps? Always full of surprises, that is what his little cupcake was. Instead, he gave her a quick hug and abandoned the kitchen to her talents. He placed the mugs on the tray and walked them out to the living room, passing out into the bright space that he had himself built. His wife took the mug and smiled up to him as he sat nearby with his own mug in his house. As the Saturday morning light of a late winter day fell across him, it mixed with the warmth of the fireplace, and he was happy. As though sensing his happiness, his grandchildren began to press toys on his hose, begging him to become the fire engine, the delivery wagon, the post stallion in his cart. As his wife smiled over him, he let his large frame become their mountain. The castles of Canterlot suddenly were perched regally upon his head. That is how Cupcake found him, as he came to tell them about breakfast being ready. As their grandchildren ran off to the kitchen, he lifted his wife gently onto her wheelchair and rolled down the fine black herd floor that he himself had laid into the bright kitchen. As they sat around the breakfast table, he led them when a small and folk as his eldest daughter finally came down the stairs. As the entirety of his family sat around him, Cupcake's father was happy and it showed upon his face. The morning slid on and as noon began to creep around the house, he went outside began to look the structure over from the outside. Following the lines of his home, he noted where some of the cedar singles were coming loose, where the paint looked to have chipped, where the ice had grown against the slide over the winter. More summer jobs, more small tasks to accomplish to keep his home in the best possible shape. He had built this home, and made this whole place a refuge from the world. It was a place where those he had loved could be safe and surrounded by love. That was what he had built. A castle of heavy timbers and soft earth tones. As he returned to the ports, he saw Cupcake getting ready once more to head off into that world. The Ponyville beyond. You off to work? He asked. She so stumped slightly as he walked around the spruce tree. Oh yes, yes! She so answered, laughing at her own surprise. <laughs> yes, I'm off. You have a good day, little Cupcake. He said while accepting her hug. He stopped and looked down at her. You know, he said... I would love to meet your partner in this business of yours. What was it? Catering? Cooking? I bet she's a clever girl. Yes, she said anxiously. Something, something like that. Food service. She pointed to a tray of cookies sitting on the steps she had made the night before. I, I thought they'd gone dry, but I think they're still good. Try one with you, Daddy, she said quickly. With that, she headed down the steps, her host making rapid sads down the sidewalk. She stopped to wave back at her father at the gate. As it came open, he waved back to her. He did not blame her for not wanting to tell him until the time was right. He could sense that she was her own mayor, that she was making her own decisions. She was decisive, clever. He knew she wanted to make her own name, did not want to rely on his business contacts, his reputation. He was proud of her. He knew she could do well. She was his little filly, his little cupcake. She handled so much had been his strength at times. As he watched her go, he could not help but feel there was more to it. That worried him, that she did not trust him with that much information. To him, trust was everything. He wondered why she would not. But he quickly stopped himself. He knew. Knew what he had done. Trust. Trust matters. As he parted that thought, a collection of one of the few groups of ponies he trusted came up the street. Howdy. He called out. Raising his hoof to a smile, going across his face of the family, at the foot of the path, they stopped upon the sidewalk as he gathered up the tray. The stallion tried down to meet him. Good morning to ye, answered Clyde as he took Cup Lodger's hoof in his own. You're looking a little plump there, Clyde, he answered with a wide grin. Roxy's been making far too much good food over the winter. I suspect you'll burn it all off come spring on that farm of yours, too. He bowed to the mare and looked down to the three beautiful fi four beautiful fillies that smiled up at him. We've been mostly in fine, most blessed, but as our pink of meanest mark that has been putting the weight on us. Clyde spoke with a self-conscious laugh. Cookie's smile, her father smiled down at the girls, 
especially the one he remembered seeing being called Pinky. The filly was literally bouncing in place as those who were a wellspring of energy that did not know which way to go, as those who were attempting to be in all places at once. He looked up to this family, a good family, good phonies, honest folk. As he did, he remembered the train he brought with them. Wish you might at all if I offered the girls a cookie or two. My little cupcake made him yesterday. He asked as he bowed to Roxy once again. No, not at all. Please feel free to, she answered. As the Phillies reached for the treats, their mother scolded them over a slight tone. Inky, blinky, pinky, mauled, what do you say? The four Phillies looked up to him with crumbs already on their faces and tied together in tune. Thank you, Mr. Quarry! Ba, ba, ba. You probably already guessed this if you actually watched the original video. Also, I have the feeling you if they didn't watch the original series, they've already either read this or be already figured it out because our audience is full of smart people. Yes, full of smart, wonderful viewers. Being quarry means that you have been stolen from and hunted since you were 12 years old. That the year that one of the wars stole the life out of your big brother? You never got to say goodbye. That was when you realized all the meanings of your name. Being Quarry means that you arrived at Ponyville with nothing, feeling like a hunted animal, pursued by those who had taken everything from you. Being Quarry means that you had a cult your age took a risk on you, helped you find one little straw to hang on, and offer you more. As Ledger had helped you gain your footing, he became more than a partner. He became a friend. Being quarry means that you grew on this one business, worked with the good, honest culturists. They have, were a rugged, truthful group of ponies. They relied on you. You did not disappoint them. Soon, you were back in good fortune. Your efforts earned you the respect of the rock farmers, especially this one and his wife. Being quarry means that you branched out and started other businesses. You fought hard to regain all that you had lost. Being quarry means that the first time some pony tried their old tricks on you here in Ponyville, your old rage returned, your wrath, and it was only by some miracle he survived and you did not go to jail. Being quarry means that acts of spectacular violence are directed at those who would deceive you against those who would hurt those you love. Being quarry means that the only mayor who ever realized you were hurt, that he had been a victim so much that all you ever really wanted was to be respected. Being quarry means that wishing well, Lesnar's sister, saw more in you than any other pony you had ever met. It means he fell in love with you, and you with her. Being quarry means that you wanted to give her everything, surround her in your love, prove to her that her admiration for you was deserved. Being quarry means that when you contracted for your new house, the contractors missed their completion dates. Being quarry means that you taught yourself how to build, how to transform stone and wood into a structure using the pallets of building material being left on your lawn for weeks at a time. Being quarry means that when they threatened to sue you for breach of contract, you very firmly, loudly, and violently pointed out they did it first. You then shoved whatever building materials remained into places on their body that were not designed for such. Being quarry means that first you filled your life with love, as you filled you, the house you had built with her for children. Being quarry means that whatever happened outside these walls, Inside them, you are allowed at all times to offer love, receive it, be a father. Being quarry means that your anger never left you, that it was too far engraved upon you to be expunged. Being quarry means that knowing your wrath accomplishes things that would otherwise be denied you. Being quarry means they cannot ignore you because they fear you. Being quarry means forever being afraid means that at night, you whisper and folk at their evoke that your family may never have reason to fear you. Being quarry means that the knowledge that they do haunts you. 
being quarry means knowing that your wrath is what sent your oldest cult off to Manhattan to run your interests there. Being quarry means that when your second son joined the military, he did it to learn to discipline to never be like you. Being quarry means that your third cult did not live more than a week. Being quarry means that you held his little body to yours as the life drifted out of him. Even the lives of your children have been stolen from you. Being Quarry means that after her husband was killed in battle, your oldest daughter sat in the dark of her apartment, falling further and further into depression. It means knowing that the fear of your wrath actually kept her from returning home, bringing her children to a bright place where they could find refuge. Being Quarry means that your middle daughter does not speak with you often, only comes around to see her mother. It means she's afraid that you'll judge her unicorn mare friend, maybe even chase her out of her life. Is this implying that this is Lyra and Bon that this is Bon Bon's dad? Think about it, won't you? Being Quarry means not knowing how to tell her you only hope she is happy, and that this is all you want for her. Being quarry means you beat the well of a cult who made your youngest daughter call out no in alarm. Being quarry means knowing that your anger scared her, terrified her, made her flee to the home of your best friend and the smart daughter he had raised. Being quarry means that on a cold morning, you awoke to find Wishing Well having a seat. Being quarry means you tried to use your strength to keep her from hurting herself. Being quarry means that the doctor said it was genetic. Something about having traces of Pegasus genes. Having the magic of Pegasi show up unusually strong against her earth pony magic, disrupting it. Being quarry means finding out that this was most likely what killed your youngest son. Being quarry means that as she gets weaker, you have to gently carry her into the bathroom. Means you have to wash her like being she was a child. Being quarry means that you built a lift inside your home. It means that even as you get older, there's nothing you will not do for her. For them. Being quarry means overhearing jokes in the tavern about her family. Ledger's family. You hear one pony joke that her Pegasus ancestor had kept the secret in the family. That her family tree had not branched. Being quarry means that you beat him into something best described as paste. Being quarry means having to beg. It means having to beg your oldest daughter to come live with you. To bring the foals to a place where they can be safe and warm. It means that you promise her not to be angry in front of them. It means blowing it entirely when you go to Ledger's Mill to apologize to your youngest, your little cupcake. It means having to stand on Ledger's porch and beg her to come home as Ivory prepared to go off to Canterlot. Being quarry means you both rely on your wrath, your anger, and live in fear of it. Being quarry means that you hate and despise those that use you. Here's your family to get to you. Being quarry, even though you want what is best for your family, you will not hesitate to do he devastating, horrible things to anyone who you felt was using them. Being quarry means that you know all of this, and you never wanted to be this way. Being quarry means that you hope there's some way out of it before you have a stroke or a heart attack. Being quarry means not thinking it very damn likely. There are very few sounds in the world of breaking that sound like snapping gingerbread men. Gingerbread. As Carrot had removed the foundation, he sat carefully upon the table, making sure there was nothing that would endanger it. As Cupcake whipped up some more frosting, the two had taken great care to make sure that the gingerbread house was supported adequately, that no harm could come to it. They laid it aside the foundation as they prepared to insert the gift, making sure that each that the critical piece was safe against all harms. Both had taken their time in doing so. Both had done what they thought was the right thing to do. Yet as it lay there upon the table, some chance of air seemed to catch in it. Perhaps it was the further heat from the ovens, or the cold counter upon which the gingerbread foundation had been laid. Whatever the circumstances that triggered it would follow simply fact. The foundation of the gingerbread house, that single critical piece, 
snapped. There was a little groan, then a soft wet tear across the surface appeared and became deeper. In the world of baking, there is no sound quite like the sound of gingerbread baking, breaking. As that sound filled the kitchen, Cupcake looked at her husband and gave a gasp. As he looked to her past the doll, but frosting that sound on his nose, he realized the project was now in jeopardy. That everything they had been working towards was now going to waste. The girls re-entered the room, their host streaked with mud. The mud had found its way up to their black dresses, even seemed to catch in their manes. Yet as they came forward, it was hardly the mud that caught the attention of those that gathered there. The field director moved to let them pass. Let Inky, Blinky, Maud, and Pinky smear the wet earth across the floor of the parlor. Knew enough to let the girls moan in their own way. The flowers stood in their mouths, freshly gathered from the short lawn. There were no long stems, no fancy petals. Instead, the girls brought with them across the purples and blacks of the rug to where their parents stood, were bluebells, shiny jump ups, dandelions, buttercups, and the white flowers of crocuses. These early flowers, the flowers of a world just awakening after a winter wrap up, became their offerings. As they joined their parents, the tearful eyes of the assembly of mourners were upon the three little sisters. Clyde lifted each girl in turn, let them lay the flowers among the still, quiet form of his mother. As he did, each girl laid a kiss on the forehead of their grandmother, let their eyes fall over her sweet repose one last time before he lowered them to the floor. Goodbye, Granny Pie, Pinky said, her voice caught. She too laid flowers, lingering over the one who had taught her how to deal with her fears. Roxy took the girls outside, the funeral director bringing her moist towels as they went. Clyde watched them go, felt his brother place his hoof to his foreleg. Together, the two stallions spoke in folk over the solid form of their mother, kissed her hoof, and with a bow, backed away from the casket. He, with a nod, the funeral director, the assembly, watched the staff close the box. With that, the casket was consigned to the flames. I love your mother, he says. He watched the tears roll down Drexel's face, feeling them roll down his own. Be with father, your parents. The waters of the well keep you all. The brothers accepted the hugs of older family members, cousins, and friends. Soon the assembly began to depart. Soon it was only those who refused to leave them alone in their mourning that remained. Clyde walked to the porch of the funeral home. There was a wet, dirty pile of pals that showed where his girls had been wiped to the mud they had gathered as he found the flowers and prepared their offerings. There was no talking, and as he passed along the ports, he saw his black-clad family sitting there, the rough breezes of the early spring tossing at them. They were so very quiet, as quiet as the house had been before Pinky found her mark. He saw the girls leaning against their mother with Inky in her lap. He sat down beside, blinking, squeezing between her mother and father. Maud, Maud having her usual look of, of stone-facedness. Pinky hiding in his lap and beneath his hooves. Clyde looked down over Pinky and realized that her hair was once again straight and limp. Without the life he had come to see her. As though she were, suddenly without the very life he rejoiced in feeling flow from her. As worried over this, he felt her lean against his hooves and heard her voice stay small as she asked, Daddy, is Granny Pie in the well of souls? Yes, love, he answered. When a body can't to no longer keep itself alive, the mind and spirit have to leave it. He felt her move, leave her for head against his forelegs. So, she asked as she looked up to him. Granny Pie says a spirit now. Is he in the well? What's it like? What about the other parts? What about... Kai gave a small chuckle, even as he thought some new sobs. Questions, 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 questions. Her spirit is in the waters of the well. He says, he forced his voice to rise, just as though she were swimming in love itself. And all the poems she loved were gone are there with her. He looked down at his daughter, across the miles were listening. Her body's going back to ass. He did not continue. In fact, he thought on it. He knew how soon he would be spreading her ashes in all the little places he loved. The garden, the spot by the brook, on the field where she had been married. That thought, new tears began to roll down his face. 
But, but what about... Pinky began. Bloody Kamina. Roxy continued as he saw her husband feeding. You know how your granny pa taught you to giggle at the things you were afraid of? How she started to teach you how to sing and dance. Those, those things last as long as those we share with them. As long as you hold on to them. The part of your granny pie that shared them with you, her intellect, they'll last your whole life. Even the lives of those you share it with. Oh. Breathed the somber pinky. See your sisters return to hanging their heads as they reflected on what had been said. Pinky felt wetness above her. Felt drops across her mane. She looked up to see her father fighting tears. Soon he had lost his battle. A great gasp. The tears rolled down his face and around her as he sat in his lap. A thousand images rolled through Clyde's mind. Memories, thoughts, songs, the whispers of his mother's voice. These all floated around him. A recent memory hung in the forefront. It was his mother teaching Pinky about music. A lesson that must now go incomplete. Don't cry, Danny. Pinky said, turning and reaching up to him. No, it's all right, spoke her mother, leaning closer and gathering Inky, Blinky, and Maud to their father as well. Your granny pa was a lovely mare, and she's earned his tears. Tis no shame in crying for the ones we love, Pinky. Oh, said Pinky. So she had been given permission, she too began to weep. As the family sat there, the cold and early spring wind flooded over them. As Clyde felt his daughter's tears catching his coat, he gathered her in closer. As mine, he begged that there would be some point he would help her, reached into that part of her that his mother had brushed open. With that, he whispered to Nemo's mother once more, and laid his head to that of his wife and his children sat near him. Meanwhile, I know what a damn lever is all today is, was called Quarry, striking the desk. Y'all talk to me like I'm a fool again, and we'll be done with this damn quick. Silence reigned around the small office once more. One of the three business ponies, the thin one he immediately hated, cleared his throat. <coughs> I, I, I apologize. I, we weren't aware of that, Hugh, he said while his throat constricted as he sat under the gaze of the stallion. I've been in business longer than you've been alive, Colt. Corey said, leaning far across the desk. As he did, another one of the business ponies, the fat one that he immediately hated, gave small whimpers. Corey leaned back, so that he made his point. No point in making them wet themselves. He would hate to clean it up. So what you're proposing, Corey said, leaning to prospectus, is that you'll buy my loans and cover them, but you'll not actually buy the loans. Uh, that's exactly what we're saying, said the spurred postess pony, the angry one he immediately hated. That's our offer. Sounds like a fool's air buying up risk and no reward. He says he looked deeper into the proposal of Proposcus. There was an obvious plan here, of course. He wanted to see, waited to see which one of these three colts had the guts to say it. By buying up risk, said the vet one. Cover it. We, 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 we can build our own credit. By, by doing that, if the loan is paid, we get credit and you get paid back, said the thin one, jumping in as he saw his partner faltering under Corey's gaze. Ponyville is the last stop before Cantillon on both of the principal southern railroads, and with the third one planning on this, the thin one gave a gulp as Corey's gray eyes shifted to him. Oof. This thing could eventually grow into an important city. The thin one trailed off as Corey gazed down at him, leaned forward with a measured huff. These are good folks here in Pointerville, he stated matters fatly, the statement having little meaning apart from informing them where his loyalty lay. He looked them all up and down once more, then turned back to the proboscis. So, he says, his deep breath drifted out over the small, sparse office where the three colts sat squished together in front of him. You bow at my risk. If everything works out, you just grow your credit line. And I still get my due over a longer period, I say. But there is in print. If the loan fails, you get the lack of dead assets, and I get my due in cash instead of an empty building. That, that's it entirely," 
said the same one at the same time as he attempted against some room to move. I don't see why you don't just ask to buy the damn loans off of me. I'd save you more money in the end if you did. Rumble Quarry, his voice once more judgmental. This is the way it, it, it keeps us prepared to say you own the loan, said the fat one, sweat running down his face. It, and it's your special way of doing business that we think will keep your risk and, and keep my risk down. Quarry gave a series of satisfied laughs. Deep rumbling once it shifted around the office. <laughs> and how is it that you cults are aware of my unique reputation in the world of business? He said, affecting the ears of the distinguished class of points he so loathed. I grew up in the shadow of your practices, came a voice, one that spun around the room in a hollow hiss. Where he sent his eyes to the angry cult, the one who had been trying to keep his eyes up the hardest, trying to seem unafraid of him. He was failing at it. Corey could literally feel him shaking beneath the table. Corey gave a little laugh, looked at the angry cult for a long while. You know me, spoke Corey, his voice a little rumble, but I don't remember being the well of you before. My father is Penny Pitcher, replied the cult, dropping the name before Quarry and so over a challenge. Quarry looked at the cult, saw the defiance be behind his eyes. As he gave some more laughs, he looked back up to the cult with a snarling grin. You're the fool of that son of a bitch, huh? <laughs> that lying, thieving goat licker, he says as his wicked smile grew larger. How's his limp? The anger dropped out of Colt as he withered under the choleric stare as the antagonism was replaced by fear and shame. Corey laughed a little more and leaned back in his chair. It was quiet around the room as Corey read some more. He coasted along the list of names of his loans that they wanted to buy. He had to admit, they were smart ones if they were looking to get into Pinefields' business and win credit. Would, Corey would have rejected the offer. It was for personal loans, college loans, but there were none. Instead, they were all real estate and business loans. These cults were hedging their bets. Worst comes to worst, and all these loans failed, they would be left with swaths of property in one of Equestria's fastest growing cities. Clever. Very clever. He looked at the names. Near the top, he found himself tripping over one, not once, but twice. He couldn't help but ponder it. Carrot Cakes Bakery Company, LLC Incorporated. Being asked it was such a poor name and all. Yes, he did. He felt something pull out him. I'm going to give all these companies a chance to sign on with you or not. He says he rocked his chair. We're going to wait till the end of next month. The three Colts began talking at once, raising demands and trying to convince him otherwise. As he blathered away, Corey began to feel himself twitch, felt his blood pressure rising. Soon his muscles ached, and once he stood, reared like a wild horse and caught him in his graze. Though no record of what said next exists, suffice it to say the cults left the room looking rather white with a promissory note and hoof. They would pay him 100 bits in advance for each loan that had been decided as the color drained from their faces. Corey would keep the money for each loan to subscribe to the risk abatement program. It was easy money, that he knew. Almost all of them were assured to switch to these young entrepreneurs. Young cults who might be more forgiving if they missed a payment, even if it would take longer to pay back their loans. Even if they still knew they owed him money, it would allow most of them to think that he was now some sort of layer of protection between he and them. That fear was always there, and he would rather have it than not had learned that that was the only real motivator. Some even hired employees just to bring him his checks every month so that he would not have to sit under his gaze. However, if one of his customers chose to stay with him, he would owe the Colts the interest, the 100 bits, and the payment. It could be anywhere from little as 300 bits to as much as 1,000. No fool would want to stick with him, though, so it was a safe bet. Even if he did get some pony full enough to turn down the offer, he would only be in trouble if the loan failed. It was staying for a bit losing those bits, though. He would let them know that. 
He explained all this to Paperclip, the secretary listening intently. She too dropped her eyes across the list of proposed purchases. Oh. He heard her give a little sound of disappointment. Karen King's Bakery Company, LLC, Inc. There goes my treats every two weeks. Meh. Answered Corey as the name once more rattled his head. He's not a bad call, Corey. Censored the secretary. No. Answered Corey. No, them are at first. Then they end up like those three other suckers. Just wanting and scheming. He closed his door. And as he did, Paperclip raised her hook to her mouth. At that moment, she realized she would actually miss seeing Carrot Cake come around. We had to savor every bite of whatever treats he gave him the next time he came. Most likely the last time. Corey sat at his desk. Landed there with a grunt. He massaged his hips and legs. Rearing like that had done something to him. You're getting old, he told himself. Oh, damn bastard. Carrot Cake's Bakery Company, LLC Incorporated. The name of the bakery slashed through him once more. Couldn't figure out why. He focused on his family. Used them to drive all the nonsense away. Yet even in his thoughts, he couldn't help but think about those who had used him. Those who attempted to use Lesnar's family to get to him. Had attempted to use his own children to weasel their way into his business and money. Rage grew behind those eyes. Old families that were long on history and short on funds had taken to trying to have their sons court his daughters. No wonder his middle daughter had run off, was living with a unicorn bear in Baltimore. Some of them even sent Demelo's proposals through the mail. The damn mail! Adele, he thought. They knew what he would do to them if he even mentioned the word dowry in his presence. That ancient and laughable idea only existed in the minds of the most affluent of families. Instead, he found himself pondering what type of coal he hoped Cupcake would find. Of all likely ideas, the name of Carrot Bakery Company, LLC, Incorporated, once more flashed through his mind. Paperclip could hear him laughing through the office door. That gangly mess, that ditzy bakery cult, that underbiting, stuttering prick, that... You know, I just thought about it, but what if Corey's Equestria Girls form is a very big, hulking, almost Oral Schwarzenegger-style man? We're talking massive three o'clock shadow! Corey stopped himself. He knew he was being unfair. It was hypothetical. That's a trick played on his mind for thinking about two unrelated things. He doubted that they even met at the mill. Besides, Kate owed him money. Debt doesn't mix. Business and family have some agenda. Something he would want for being with her. Debt crossed the line. Crossed it early. No stallion was going to use his family, especially not his little cupcake, to get close to him into his money. The only way that cults with such damn notions were going to get close to his daughter was if the pieces he tore off of them landed near her. 2017 and 16, I gotta admit, were interesting for me as both years, as both a live reader and a writer. Around near the end of 2017, I had finished Fall, fall of Fall of Starfleet, Rebirth of Friendship. On the other side here, I was doing more and more longer stories and stuff that I came to really enjoy. What brings me to the to three notable villains we've had on this show. I call them villains because they're kind of reoccurring. Mike and Von Doom and Reality Check. I encountered Reality Check as a Knicks fan and grew to already hate his stuff. And he set off as a good replacement villain for Mike and. I've mentioned before when it comes to villains and when it comes to my style, I always saw myself as not a reviewer, just a guy who likes to talk about things he likes. So, in this case, I was kind of advancing a style to a reviewer I admire. We all know that to be like Kara. And I figured one fun thing I could do was set up the idea of these three main threats. Besides, they kind of represent a lot of things I hate about bad fanfics. So, 
that's why I went with Micah for a while. He was kind of fun. Basically, my personal Roger Corman. But the first one was Von Doom because his stuff was the stuff I truly hated when we first did this. And all in all, I felt like it was always kind of fun to do. Just come up with reasons why I didn't like these guys and just and really have fun. It's not like I really, really care. It was more just a fun thing to do, just to pretend that I have this villain that sets it up. And when I feel like they can, I can add something new, that's why I bring them out again. <laughs>